This is Radio Eco Shock with Alex Smith. Here is the latest shocking headline in this age of climate change. Antarctica losing six times more ice mass annually now than 40 years ago. To explain the breaking science, we are joined by Dr. Eric Rignot, Chair of Earth System Science at University of California, Irvine, and Senior Research Scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Eric Rignot, welcome to Radio EcoShock. Thank you very much. Just 10 years ago, we were told, don't worry about Antarctica. Sea ice there was actually expanding. We thought snow was piling up deeper in the interior of the continent. How did we get from there to your new results published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences? Well, uh, sort of 10 years ago, we had already uh, indications that uh, some significant changes were taking place in the Antarctic I think uh, the light turned on about this about the mid-1990s. But it takes more time to collect more data and understand what we were saying better in order to come to firmer conclusion. What you mentioned uh, in terms of snowfall accumulation in the interior relates to old climate models that represented Antarctica as a sort of a sluggish mass uh, only responding to change in snowfall which were predicted to increase because of increased evaporation of the uh, surrounding warmer ocean. What we found uh, in the last uh, 20-plus years is that the glaciers draining the ice from the Antarctic continent are responding to climate forcing. They're responding in a stronger way and in a slightly different way than what, what was anticipated. And in 2014, you and your team said that some of the melting in a section of West Antarctic ice sheet was, quote, unstoppable. Can we now say that about other parts of Antarctica? I think uh, one of the highlights of this study is that uh, there are other parts of uh, Antarctica, especially in East Antarctica, that seem to be vulnerable and are changing slowly right now and potentially hold more sea level rise potential than the West Antarctic part that is um, slowly falling apart right now. So it's sort of uh, suggesting that more of the Antarctic continent is at stake than what we thought uh, some years ago. At the other pole of the Earth, Eric, the Arctic has been abnormally, unbelievably hotter. Has the same thing happened in Antarctica, and is that the cause of the increasing rate of ice loss there? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Both Greenland and Antarctica are actually mostly reacting to a change in uh, ocean heat uh, along the periphery of the island or the continent. In addition, in Greenland, of course, we have very warm air temperature that increase the melt of the ice sheet. In the Antarctic, the air temperature has not risen to the point where we melt the snow and ice. Uh, And in fact, Antarctica as a whole has not been warming up as fast as the rest of the world, whereas Greenland has been warming at two to three times the rest of the world. So situations are a bit different, but the processes that are conducive to the disappearance of the land ice are similar. They are related to more warm ocean waters in contact with the ice sheet. So I could explain to you a little bit what's happening in the Antarctic if you're interested. I'm very interested. Please do. So what's happening in the Antarctic is that uh, the wind regime around the Antarctic, the westerlies that circulate clockwise around the Antarctic, if you're looking at South Pole, have increased in strength uh, over time and markedly since the 1980s. They do that because Antarctica has not been warming up as fast as the rest of the world. So the temperature difference between Antarctica and the warming world has increased and that results in stronger winds circulating around the continent. So not only these winds are getting stronger, they're contracting towards South Pole. And as a result of the Coriolis force, these winds tend to push the surface waters to the north, which in part explains the slight expense of the sea ice. And to compensate for that, they push the subsurface waters to the south. And in the polar regions, the heat is not at the surface, it's below the surface, several hundred meters, where the water is warmer and saltier. That's why it's stable there. And that salty and warm water 
is able to melt the glaciers around the Antarctic much faster than it did in the past, and that is conducive to the glaciers accelerating into the sea because they feel less resistance to flow when they come to the coastline. Some of the plugs in front of them have been removed by the ocean, and they are able to flow slightly faster. And your paper mentions the ozone hole as a contributing factor. Why is that? Yes, um, strangely, the ozone is also a participant. Uh, the, the disappearance of the ozone layer as resulting in a, a cooling of the stratosphere in the Antarctic because you don't have as much interaction between the ozone and incoming um, uh, UV radiations from the sun. So that contributes also to the fact that uh, the Antarctic is not warming up as fast as the rest of the world. Another factor that we should not forget about is that uh, the snow fields, the the snow cover in the Arctic is reducing uh, very rapidly. The sea ice, as we know, has been reduced in a spectacular fashion. Uh, So as a result, we're replacing a very highly reflective surface in the Arctic by something that absorbs the solar radiation more. And as a result, the Arctic is warming a lot faster than the rest of the world. In the Antarctic, we don't have that. The Antarctic continent is almost as vast as before. The snow is not melting. The sea ice has not been retreating very rapidly. So in terms of the radiation budget, how much heat is absorbed by the Antarctic from the sun, there's been very little change compared to what's happening in the Arctic. We don't get a lot of news from Antarctica, but when we do, it's often about huge ice shelves falling off West Antarctica, like the Larsen B many, many years ago. Are those really important events? Yeah, they are very significant events, um, especially the Larsen B event that you mentioned, because prior to this event, there was still a little bit of debate in the community as to whether this uh, floating extension played any role in buttressing, in holding back all the land ice from the Antarctic from uh, spilling out into the ocean. Uh, so when we saw the breakup of Larsen B, we looked at the glaciers upstream of that ice shelf to figure out whether they would speed up or not. And not only they sped up, they accelerated by a factor three to eight in a very short term period. And we are now 17 years later, and these glaciers are still flowing three to five times about their about their prior speed, which shows that the change uh, in that part of Antarctica was. Uh, irreversible and unstoppable. So West Antarctica is the sort of point that heads up towards Chile and Argentina, but the large part of the continent is East Antarctica. Have you more to report in this new paper about that part of the South Pole? Yeah, so the the traditional view on East Antarctica, uh, which is, as you said, the largest share of the Antarctic continent, is that it sits higher. It's higher in elevation. It sits on bedrock that, for the most part, is above sea level, whereas West Antarctica is grounded on bedrock below sea level. That's why we call it a marine ice sheet. So the prevailing view on East Antarctica is that um, it's it's uh, not vulnerable to change. It's, it's as cold as can be, and nothing can perturb it. Most of the changes that we see in East Antarctica, however, are along the coastline. And as I said earlier, the surrounding ocean plays a very important role in uh, the evolution of these glaciers. And uh, they are the sort of knobs that control how much of that ice in the East Antarctic Plateau is able to spill out to the Southern Ocean. And we found that these knobs have a few leaks in them. And after an exhaustive survey you found in the 1990s, ice loss from Antarctica more than tripled from the previous decade, and it's gone up again every decade since. Is there a way to predict that rate of loss for the next few decades? Well, that's sort of uh, the ultimate goal of um, all these studies, uh, besides uh, detailing exactly what's happening to the polar regions and understanding the physical processes that uh, control the evolution of the ice, we want to put that uh, new knowledge, new understanding of the evolution of the ice into numerical models, uh, sophisticated numerical models that include not only the ice, but the surrounding ocean, the atmosphere, the winds. 
so that we can make a uh, more reliable uh, projection of sea level in the future. So right now, the projection that we have, uh, I would call rather primitive, uh, because they don't include all the key components, and they are also conservative, because they do not represent the vector of very rapid changes uh, in the Antarctic, which are the glaciers. And most of what we're seeing today says that the glaciers are the vector of the mass change in the Antarctic. So until we have a very reliable description of what they do in these models, uh, the projection of sea level rise from the Antarctic in the future uh, should be called into question and, and be considered as conservative as to what may happen in the future. Now, as glaciologists, we don't want to tell the public uh, what a conservative scenario might be, we would like to be able to inform them about the worst-case scenario, because in the case of sea level, you just want to know how bad things can be rather than some middle-range uh, ways of sea level. And do you have a, a guesstimate on what that might be by the year 2100? How, how much will we get? Well, we are right now, if we look at the rate of increase of the mass loss from Greenland, from Antarctica, and from all the mountain glaciers around the world, and if we add up the thermal expansion from the ocean, we are on a pace that is going to take us to one meter sea level rise by 2100. It is likely that the pace of uh, decay of the polar regions will probably get higher than that. We've only seen uh, sort of the beginning of... Um, the decay of the polar regions. But that also depends on what we do with our climate system. Not the whole history of the 21st century is written in stone yet. The next 20, 30 years are probably written in stone. But what's going to happen after that depends also on how we control uh, climate warming. Eric, what will you be working on next? Uh, we continue our work in Greenland. Um, I think my... Um, Main focus in the coming years is to gather more data around the Antarctic, and especially in East Antarctica, so we can make timely and solid progress in uh, constraining the evolution of, uh, uh, of this part of Antarctica, so we can put that knowledge in models and, and improve uh, the reliability of these models at projecting what's going to happen in the coming decades. This way, uh, the public and policymakers will have more solid data in hand to make the right decision for, for our future. In the meantime, I'm still keen to convey my, uh, the information we gather from satellites and airborne platforms and other means to the general public so that they stay informed of what's going on right now and hopefully appreciate that uh, we have a serious problem in the polar regions that's going to affect all of us. Well, I'll put some links to this new science and more about how to find out what NASA is discovering in our weekly show blog at ecoshock.org. We have been talking with Dr. Eric Reno, head of the Earth Sciences at University of California, Irvine, and senior research scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Eric, thank you so much for this briefing. You're most welcome. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. Check out the Radio Ecoshock website. We're at ecoshock.org.